Good morning and welcome to the last and final and maybe best day of Roots Tech. Thank you for joining me this morning. I know it feels early, but I promise you will be rewarded for coming this morning because you are going to feel confident in using DNA in your family history. That's my promise to you. Now, I'm not going to promise that's going to happen in the next 45 minutes. I'm going to promise that if you keep coming and you keep learning about DNA, you will feel confident. So the thing about today is this is part four of the You Can Do the DNA series. It's okay if you haven't come to parts one through three. Who is here like jumping in at the end? Oh, most of you. Fabulous. Welcome. Welcome to jumping in at the end. So today our goal is really to work a case study beginning to end so you can feel the full process of working DNA in your family history. So we have a lot to do. So let's get started. First is this required roots text slide. I don't mind if you take pictures of my presentations. I work really hard on these graphics, like way too hard. So feel free to capture them for yourself. Uh, hopefully they will help jog your memory later about what we talked about. For those of you, which is most of you, sounds like, that missed one through three, you can still watch them. They are recorded and uh, will be available on the Roots Tech website. So part one was just how to leverage DNA testing in your genealogy experience. Part two was putting your ethnicity results to use in your research goal. And part three was following the plan to DNA success. So part four, as I mentioned, is this case study. The case study will be using what I call simply the plan. This is the very simple step-by-step -step procedure that you can follow with every single research goal you have for which DNA can be useful. So I think DNA can be useful in your research if you're looking for a three times great-grandparent or closer then we use this DNA we're talking about today, which is autosomal DNA. If you have an ancestor you're looking for who is more distant, you can turn to Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA. I think there is rarely a case in your family history that can't take advantage of DNA testing. Today, we will be working with Brenna's case study. So Brenna is a member of uh, the Your DNA Guide study group, and we, last month, as part of study group, did what we call a dive. And sometimes we offer a dive outside of the study group as well, but essentially people can submit their cases and then I just work them live for everybody to see. You can watch every click and watch me essentially do this case study. And so I asked Brenna if it would be okay with her if we could share it with you today. So thank you in advance to all of you for coming, for listening, paying attention, and to Brenna. And let's solve her case. This is Brenna's research goal. Who was Brenna's great-grandfather, the father of Minnie Filey Davis, born 1919 in Trinidad, Henderson County, Texas? I hope this research goal looks familiar to all of you. I hope you feel like you have been in a position where you're looking for a great-grandfather, or a two-times great, or a three-times great, because these are all actionable goals that DNA can definitely help you with. So this is her family tree. And you can see she's got this glaring hole in, right there in that father of Minnie Filey Davis. So that's what we're trying to fill. We're trying to find the DNA matches in Brenna's DNA match list that correspond to this section of her tree. That's the entire purpose of all of the sorting and all the grouping that we're about to do. It's to pull out of her match list, which is thousands of people long, only the matches that matter the matches that can help her fill in this particular line. So to do that, we will follow the plan. The first step in the plan is to find a best known match. And we talked about this a lot yesterday in part three, but just as a refresher for those of you who weren't there, your best known match is someone you already know your relationship to. Now, you don't have to know them, know them. I mean, you can see on your family tree and their family tree where you guys connect, and you're pretty confident in that genealogical connection. So a best known match in this case would be a descendant of this couple. 
right? If there were other people who were descendants of this unknown father and Mamie Holland, then that person would be our best known match. But we don't have one of those, right? We don't even know the father, so how could we find another descendant of the couple? So that's out. We don't have that best known match. So we're going to move back a generation, and we're going to see if we can find a best known match who's a descendant of Edward and Minnie. So this would be Brenna's first cousin. So whenever you're thinking about a best known match, you want someone who's a descendant of a different child than your ancestor. So you can see here that Brenna's a descendant of her dad, Terry, So essentially, we're just looking for one of Terry's siblings' children, or even grandchildren. That person would be our best known match. A good way to find best known matches is to cheat, of course. Now, cheating isn't usually advocated in general, but sometimes it can be faster, right, than finding an answer on your own. Our D companies, a couple of them, do have cheating so the tools available, am I not holding it right? I'm really trying. He told me I can't hold it at the bottom. Or the I don't know. It keeps going now. It's okay. I'm just going to keep talking and she'll figure it all out. So a cheating tool is fast. That's known. He's, he's a different microphone because we don't like this one. At an angle. Like this, more like a rock star, he says. This is it. He's going to bring me one anyway, and hopefully it will not make me be such a rock star. Let's try it. Thank you. Okay. All right, so cheating tools. So this one is at Ancestry. It's called Through Lines. So cheating tools do get you a best-known match faster, but you have to be cautious, right, as with all cheating procedures. You want to cheat off the right people right? I mean, hopefully you know who the right people are to cheat off of. There are people who have records, who have done their research like you have, right? Other good genealogists, ideally. So when you get to the through lines tool, you can click on Edward, which is her grandfather, and that will take you to his page, and you can see here descendants of Edward. The problem is There aren't any other children of Edward who have descendants tested. So we don't have a first cousin on Brenna's dad's side that's taken a test. We don't have a best known match. So what do we do when we don't have a best known match? Well, there are two strategies. We're going to go over one of them today. The two strategies, one of them is to use what I call the elimination method. So instead of directly being able to pull out of your match list just the matches you want, you essentially get rid of all the other matches, and the ones that are left over are the ones that you wanted. The other method I call bottoms up. It's a little more complicated. It is part of my book, like we have a, I have a book that's at my booth, so if you find that you don't have any best known matches, like we go through this elimination method and you're like, yeah, I couldn't do that, I don't have those, come by my booth and let's talk bottoms up. We'll also be talking bottoms up next week in a free webinar I'm giving because I couldn't tell you it today. And a lot of people have been asking about it and I was like, Ugh, yeah, no time today, so we'll do it next week and I'll give you that information at the end of the presentation. Okay, so we are going to use the elimination method, which will work for many of you. So Edward and Minnie don't have a first cousin best known match. So we have to eliminate all the other people. So we're going to go down here to the maternal line, and we're going to look for a best known match from our maternal line. So we go to through lines, we find that Victor, Marion Freeze. we see we do have a first cousin on that direct maternal line who can be a best known match. Now ideally, you want many best known matches. That helps us get out of that match list everybody that belongs to that line. But you work with what you have. So we are going to use a match labeling system to identify all of these maternal line matches. 
Now, you could use a really detailed match labeling system and meticulously dot every single match on the maternal side according to their relationship to their two times great grandparents. You could do all of that if you wanted to. But I think the dot system is most effectively used when you're just focused on your research goal. You're not trying to organize all the people. You don't need to organize all the people. You need to organize it in a way that lets you answer your question. Right now, our question's on our paternal side, so it doesn't really matter which maternal line people match, just that they're maternal. So we're gonna give everybody on the maternal side this same pink dot. Now, if you don't know how to use a match labeling system, that's okay. There's a link in your handout that will teach you. I have YouTube videos about how to use it both at MyHeritage and at Ancestry. So if you're not certain how to do that, you can learn. Okay, so we're using the match labeling system to get rid of that first cousin side. We'll also want to get rid of that direct paternal line. So you ask yourself, what kind of cousin is going to be a best known match on my direct paternal side to get rid of those people? Do you see how it will be a second cousin? Okay, so we're going to go to through lines. We're going to look for a second cousin, and we see a couple, actually. So we're going to click on those best known matches. We're going to use the shared matches tool. We are going to label them, again, with this maybe dark blue dot. So now you're going to ask yourself, what will the match labeling, the dot pattern of the matches that we want what will they look like in our match list? Yes, no dots, right. So you've got your list of matches and you're gonna look down that list of matches and there will or should be people with no dots. Okay, this is the beauty of the match labeling system as I describe it. A lot of people use match labels for filing. They just like to label things like we do. It's not a filing system, it's a filtering system. So last year at Roots Tech, that was the title of my talk, using matches as a filter instead of a file. So when you do it this way, again, this is super brave of you, but I really encourage you to go home and delete all of your dots. I know, it sounds really scary. And when you click it, like you go to the menu and you say delete this dot, they like pop up, are you sure? And then you're like, I don't know, am I sure? Yes, you're sure, delete them. And you start over this way, with your research goal in mind. And once you solve this research question, you're gonna delete all your dots and start over. That's what they're for. They're to help you pull out of your match list just the matches that matter. So we already have, just in two steps really, we've just identified what I call your leftovers, right? These are the matches that don't map to anywhere else in your tree, and therefore, by default, they are the matches that are going to help us answer this particular question. Okay? Not too hard, right? You got this? This is the only man who's got it. Do you guys have this? Yes. All right. Excellent. Okay. Here's the problem, is that we are going to have some of the people from Minnie's direct maternal line in this group of leftovers. We don't want those, right? We only want her paternal line. So we need to do what I call in the plan, split your network. We need to get rid also of these people. How will we do that? Finding another best known match. Yes, best known match. Right? So we need a descendant of this couple. What kind of cousin will that be? These are our two times greats. Yes, we need a third cousin who is a best known match. And our cheating tool through lines has helped us find that third cousin. Okay, so we're going to do what? We're going to click on that match. We're going to use a shared matches tool and we're going to assign those people another color dot. Here's the problem. She only had one third cousin. So if you look at that network, that Holland Buckner, that's the name of her ancestral couple, Holland Buckner network, if we only have one third cousin, 
that person is just not going to be able to give us everybody from our match list that's in that group. One third cousin is just not enough. So I talk a lot like in our DNA skills workshop and other places about how to responsibly expand your network when you don't have enough matches. And that is a strategy you can employ. But in this case, we didn't even need to because Brenna actually had some half cousins. Because Mamie later married and had additional children. That means that Minnie has half siblings who have descendants, which means we have half second cousins. Half relatives are invaluable in your research. In fact, I kind of think we all should like get married twice and have halves just so it's easier for our descendants to do research. It's so much easier with halves. Why? It's because these halves don't have anything to do with Minnie's father, which means we can use the shared matches tool on them to easily pull out this Holland Buckner line, which we did. So now we have fully eliminated from our match list anybody who is not relevant. What is our dot pattern of our best mystery matches? Still no dot, right? So now we're going to have a dot system like this. We are going to have individuals who are fully left over. Those individuals, that list, is now a list of our best mystery matches. Okay? This is the process. It works almost every time. Okay? It will not work if you have endogamy or if you have multiple relationships that you're maybe aware or unaware of. In those cases, you do have to use different strategies to find your best mystery matches. But for most of us, this system will work most of the time. So now that you've found them, let's think about who we have found. What are the best kinds of cousins that we could expect to find in this list? So imagine that this man, whoever Minnie's father was, let's say he also went on to get married and have more children. Those descendants would be Minnie's half-second cousins. Agreed? Okay. Of course, he also had parents. Okay. Theoretically, he had siblings. Descendants of those siblings would be her third cousins. These are the best kinds of matches you can find in this leftover match list. These are the ideal kinds, right? So it's really helpful before you start digging into those matches to ask yourself, what are the matches that I'm looking for? What kinds of cousins are going to help me answer this question? And then you need to know what, how much DNA they're sharing with you. So these boxes that you see here from, are from the Shared Centimorgan Project. The Shared Centimorgan Project helps us understand how much DNA you expect to share with people with given relationships. So you can see here, for a half-second cousin, it's expected that we'll share 120 centimorgans versus... Uh, and, and then underneath that, you can see the range shared by a half-second cousin is 10 centimorgans up to 325 centimorgans. Okay, so understanding kind of these ranges and kind of get that in your mind before you start diving into this match list. So we have found our best known matches, created a network, split that network, found ourselves some leftovers, and now we have this group of best mystery matches. The next step in the plan is to find your generation of connection. This is the generation where you and your match will find your common ancestor. So it doesn't matter if your match has a tree or doesn't have a tree. You should find the generation of connection for every match on that list of best mystery matches. Just understand where are you likely to connect with them. It does really, really help you as you're working through these, uh, these matches. So we're just going to start at the top. We're going to start with the best mystery match, the one that's at the very top of our list, who's sharing the most DNA. So you click on that person. It brings up their profile page. The first thing you're going to do 
is you're going to click on that total amount of shared DNA, that centimorgan count. Now, you'll notice this person is sharing 214 centimorgans. It's a lot of DNA. And it was so much that during the dive that I was doing with Brenna, I was like, I wonder if this person is actually a descendant of Minnie. But she can't be, right? Actually, I should have put that in here. Let's go back to the family tree. Let me show you. Okay, so actually, let's look at this other one. So literally from this line, she cannot have second cousins. Or she should not, right? We're suspecting, you know, a, a non, they're not married here, okay? This was a relationship, I think, what, Minnie is like 18 when she, or Mamie is 18 when she has Minnie. She was not married. So it's very unlikely that these two people had another child together. And that's the only way that she could have a full second cousin. So when we're looking at this match and we're clicking on that total amount of shared DNA, and it's going to bring up for us what I call your possible genetic relationships, right? Here they all are. What's the top possible relationship? Second cousin. But you have to recognize they really can't be, or it's so unlikely that they are second cousins. So you have to start looking at the other relationship possibilities. But we see down here at... At, um, so here's all the 68% likely possibilities. And all of these are second cousins or closer. So you see how we have to eliminate all of these because of the specific scenario we're dealing with. It really should not be any of these relationships. So we have to move down to the next tier. And we see that there is a half second cousin in that next tier. So that becomes kind of our hypothesis as our most likely relationship, okay? So if we are indeed half second cousins with this particular match, when is our generation of connection? This is this matches tree. If we are half second cousins, we should be connected, you know, at the great grandparent level. We should actually share one great grandparent. You can see this tree is not filled out. There's a lot of missing great-grandparents. And if we're being generous, we might extend that generation of connection out to the two times greats just because. So this is what you do for every match because it shows you how much genealogy you need to do. You'll have to build this tree to that generation of connection. Or you should or you could. Okay, But a lot of times, especially when I'm live, you don't have time <laughs> to just build this tree out. So what I do often, and I'll, I'll set this down. I'll say, okay, I understand the generation of connection. I understand the limited amount of genealogy that this person has. And I'll just set down this match. And I'll start with the next one. But thankfully, Brenna had already done a lot of work. And she'd already recognized a common ancestor in this tree even this small tree, with another DNA match on her match list. And she had left me a note, actually. So while you could, and you should, and you would need to, find the generation of connection with all of these matches, and we'll come back to them in a minute, I'm going to jump ahead to a match much further down that list, sharing much fewer centimorgans that Brenna had already looked at and already identified a common ancestor with. So this is the match. And again, she left me this wonderful note that the common ancestor between these individuals um, was this Jackson line. So I want to find the generation of connection with this person. So we're going to follow exactly the same procedure. You're going to click on that total amount of shared DNA. You're going to look at your possible genetic relationships. You're going to identify the relationship that seems most likely for now. Okay, this is all just a big hypothesis. You're just trying things. You just have to choose one. So don't get paralyzed by, I don't know. Just choose one. Just choose one and start with that. Your, your research will tell you if you're right or not. So just start somewhere. So we're going to call this person probably our third cousin. Okay? So what we're looking for, remember, between the trees of our matches is overlap. How are these matches related to each other? 
I think a lot of times we still make the mistake of looking in the trees of our best mystery matches for names we recognize. Guys, you're looking for somebody you don't know. You're not going to recognize their name. Okay, so you're looking between your matches for names they share in common with each other, right? So this is the couple that they share in common, this John M. Jackson with Margaret A. Jones. So that's good. We want to then draw out their tree. So I always draw out my own trees. I know it's helpful, and I do also attach them to the tree in Ancestry, if I'm in Ancestry. But I like to just make my own trees, I do this in Lucid Chart. It just makes me feel like I can lay everything out the way I want it. I can easily move people around and see people's connections. So I'm often just making my own trees. So these people should be half first cousins, not supposed to hold the bottom, half first cousins to each other. But because they're on the same line, like they're on the same generation as each other, they should have the same relationship to us. But they're sharing very different amounts of shared DNA. So things are about to get complicated, just FYI. Okay, so if you were with me, are you with me up to this point? You feeling good? Okay, I don't want to lose you here, okay? But if I do, it's fine. Just come back after I tell you, okay? So... This is where I got stuck because I was looking at these two matches and I was like, this doesn't make sense. How can these two people share such different amounts of DNA? My first thought, of course, is, well, we must be more closely related to match one than we are to match two. But it's such a short generation range between match one and two and their common ancestor. There really isn't time for me to be more closely related, and I've got to fit in my generations. It just was difficult, right? It didn't make sense to me. Let me scoot ahead a little bit. And so I thought, well, maybe I'm double related. Maybe we're also related to Mr. Oberting somehow. And so all of these thoughts start going on in my head. But what I want to remind you of is that we have already decided our generation of connection for these people. So remind yourself what you already learned about them. So for this first match, the 55 Centimorgan match, match two, we decided we were third cousins. What would that look like on the chart? When would we connect? Well, we would actually connect above John M. Jackson and Margaret Jones, which means we would have to be a descendant of one of their other kids, not John or Margaret, but one of the others. But then when we look at the generation of connection for match one, it says we should be connected as a half-second cousin. We should be related to either John or Margaret. These both, according to our hypothesis, can't be right. Do you see that? They, they both can't be right. So the problem is we don't know if this family tree is even right. Right? You've just pulled this off of whatever they posted. So these people are supposed to be half-second cousins to each other. If they're not, then our analysis is totally wrong, right? So we're so dependent on what other people have done. And when you get in a scenario like this, it's really hard unless you kind of step back and say, okay, let's double-check their family trees. Let's make sure everybody looks good, right? So I'm not going to go into all the details. Their family tree's a mess, Okay. <laughs> This, Dorothy A. Jackson, we're not sure who her mom really is. It's on different census records as different people. Um, she's supposed to not be married in, in, in a certain year, but then later she says she was. And anyway, it's tricky, right? Families are tricky, right? It would really, really help if we could see the relationship between these two people genetically to verify, which we can't do in ancestry. But if we were at my heritage, we could do it. So at MyHeritage, this is the shared matches page. In the middle is the name of your match. On the left is your relationship to that person. So you can see that first match is likely the, my second cousin's son. But on the other side, you can see your match's relationship to that match. You can see that my first match here, Paola, is actually the brother of Alberto. So helpful. 
right? I lo- this is one of my very favorite features of my heritage. But we're using ancestry right now. And so we can't tell. We don't know if these two people are actually half second cousins to each other or not. Verifying their tree has become really, really tricky. Um, again, trying to fit ourselves in here. Again, we've got some generations that we know. We've got ourselves, we've got dad, we've got Minnie. So we, it's just, it became really hard. When this happens to you, the answer is, the answer is, advance the slide. There we go. You just, you start to spin. And you start to go in, at least I do, and you start to go in all these different directions. Like, what if they're half? What if they're full? What if there's incest? What if there's, you know, you just start thinking of all the things. When really what you need to do is just get more data. Okay? The thing about DNA relationships, we think they're so, like, even, right? We think that a certain amount of DNA equals a certain amount of relationship, and it's all going to work out. And DNA is messy, It's inherited randomly. Some people get a whole bunch and some people get a very little. And that happens all the time. So what you need is more data. So it can average out and help you see the patterns and help you see what really is a higher shared amount and what's just random chance. So we need both genealogy data and genetic data in this case. So for the genealogy data, I decided I would start building out that Oberling tree. Again, I was worried about a multiple excuse me, a multiple relationship. And so I wanted to see who were his ancestors. Are they by any chance, do we know they're related to the Jackson, Harding, Jones, Long line? Like, do we have something else going on here if we could just see the tree? So in this scenario, what you do is you build a quick and simple tree. This is bad genealogy. It is. It's bad genealogy. You should never do this in real life. But when you're building the trees for DNA matches that you aren't sure how you're related to, the best thing to do is do it quickly and as efficiently as possible, and then go back and double check when you see the line that's important. There's just too much tree building that we have to do to be really, really, really meticulous. So to build a quick and simple tree, the fastest and easiest way is to go and search public member trees. You can do this at Family Search, you can do this at MyHeritage, and you can do it at Ancestry. You've probably never done this before. Why would you? But this is the fastest way. We want to see if that Mr. Oberting is in somebody else's tree already. So I'm going to put in Margaret Jackson, the wife, and I'm going to put Mr. Oberting down here at the bottom as the spouse, And I'm going to see if somebody has that person. And they do. There's Margaret Elizabeth Jackson. There's the spouse. I now have his full name, Marion Stephen Oberting. I can click on him. That gives me his profile page. If I click on tools, I can click on view and tree. I can click on save to tree. And you want to start building this person's tree in your own tree. So we call these little like floating branches of your tree. So you'll just add this person to your tree and then disconnect them from your tree, like delete parents, and they'll become this floating person in your tree, and then you just build them out so that everything's in one place, in one tree. A lot of people build different trees for every DNA match, and then you have like 70 trees in your account, and it's hard to keep track of everybody. Just keep it all in your tree. So at the beginning of our DNA skills workshop, I tell everybody to create a DNA tree. This is not your research tree. This is not your wonderful tree that you've worked so hard to build. This is a tree you can just be messy with and add tons of people like Mr. Oberting to and not stress. Okay? So you add him to your tree. Then you start building out his family tree. by. Um, so that's what I've done. I've added him to the tree, and I'm putting him in my tree or in Minnie's tree. And then I'm searching for him because he's already there, and I save him in the tree. And then I just add whatever that tree had. Of course, you're looking at the records. You're trying to – a lot of times there's multiple trees. You're looking for the best one. But your goal, again, is just to build it quickly, which I did. And just by putting those people in, Ancestry's like, oh, hey, we know all these other people, by the way, too. And I can look through here quickly, and I don't see any overlapping names. So my worry that there was some kind of multiple relationship between the Obertings and some other line in our tree has kind of been like, okay, I don't see that right away. 
Does everybody understand about quick and simple trees and kind of why we do it and how we do it and how it feels kind of yucky, but you do it anyway? Okay. How do you make a floating tree? So to make a floating tree, you go to a person in your tree. You would say, like, add child. You would add Mr. Oberting as the child, and then you would click on Mr. Oberting, and you'd go and edit his parents, and you would just delete him out. And then he becomes like this, yeah, ethereal floating person in your tree, not connected to anyone. Okay, so we did some genealogy. There's probably a lot more genealogy we could have done, but we're going to go back now to the genetics, and we're going to look for more DNA matches. So I'm just going to go down the list of these leftovers, these best mystery matches, and I'm going to start over. I'm going to look for their generation of connection by clicking on that total amount of shared DNA. I'm going to look at their trees and decide how far I have to build them out. So it just keeps going. So I've decided the generation of connection with this person is here. I got very little to work with. Where am I going to start? Alfred Sickle. I'm going to figure out who his wife was. I'm going to build out his line. And I'm going to keep building a quick and simple tree. And it looks like this. <laughs> it's so much work. It takes a long time. But it pays off. Because eventually, when you do that with enough people, again, again, and again, and again, we looked through lots and lots and lots of matches and did the same procedure for all of them. You build a tree. And you see, there's actually several people who are related to this Jackson-Jones couple, some that are even just descendants of John Jackson with Margaret Harding. And you begin to gather the data that you need to do better analysis. And just a quick shout out to this match, DM. All they had were initials and no tree. And so I called Lori Napolitano, who works for me. She's a, a coach in our academy. She is amazing at finding living people. And I said, can you figure out who this guy is? She's like, sure. And so we figured out, again, he's the child here um, that you see in that Adams line. So it's a lot of work. But once you do it, you have the data that you need to be successful. So our goal now is to figure out, well, we've put ourselves right here. Who is this person? Is, does this person exist in this tree? It's time to do genealogy and find out, did this couple, John M. Jackson and Margaret A. Jones, have a son who could be the dad? So we go to the genealogy. And we look at the 1910 census, and we identify this family, there's John and, Ma and Maggie. Isn't that cute? She goes by Maggie. John and Maggie, they've got five girls and one son. Isn't that convenient? I felt like it was really convenient because usually it's the other way around. They've got one daughter and five sons. And then you'd have to figure out which of the sons could be there, right? But it doesn't, that doesn't solve it, right? He's, he is the only son of this couple. He is of age, but he's totally in the wrong place. And we, I mean, we could do a lot more genealogy. <laughs> and we need to. And Brenna, I'm sure, is already doing it. Hi, Brenna, if you're watching. But he seems to be the best and most likely candidate, even though he's not in the right place. Of course, we don't know everything about his life or all the things in between, and we may not know. But the next step really is to what I call Ask Watto. So Watto is a tool by um, Johnny Pearl, of DNA painter, and he helps us to take this tree we've built and ask this question, where do I fit? That's the question, right? Now that you've found all the people, you've built the tree, you've got to figure out, is this a good place for her? Genetically, could she fit here? So there's a new version of Watto, and perhaps you've seen it already this weekend. I'm sure lots of people are talking about it. It's really fun. Both versions are still available. You could use either in this situation. We are going to use Watto Plus. So you click on Watto Plus from the DNA Painter website, and then they have this really nice interface that helps you think through your actual question. I love forms that help you identify what you're actually trying to do so that you come into the, to the form, to the tool, with the right mindset. So I'm going to look for, and, and I filled this out for you here. So I would like to identify the biological parent of who? 
of Minnie, our ancestor. That's who we're looking for. We're looking for the biological parent of Minnie. She was born in the year 1919. And then I'm using the DNA matches of who? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we would have tested Minnie? We didn't. But we're using Brenna, who is Minnie's grandchild. This whole scenario helps you think through what exactly you're doing. And I really love that about this interface. So when you fill it all out, you can also indicate where your matches are from, which can make a difference. And the title for your tree, of course, you'll want to label that. It's also important to make sure that you're thinking, of, it's, I think it's hard to get tripped up. So follow the prompts in the form. Think through it. Make sure you're filling out everything correctly because this is huge. This makes a big difference in the analysis. So step one, fill out the form correctly. Then you build the tree. Now you can import a JEDCOM if you want to, but I just chose to build the tree by hand because it's not that big. So you start by entering John, and, and you can put his wife in there if you want to. So the important things that you want to add about people, so you see I've built John and then John, and then I've got Margaret Jackson and her sister Alice. Putting in birth years is really helpful for Watto. It can take them into account if you add them. So if you know them, put in the birth years for everybody that you're putting into the tree. Spouses, doesn't matter that much um, unless you want it just for yourself. So the other thing you can do is define these half relationships. Remember in the tree, we had that half relationship between those first two matches we were looking at. So you'll want to make sure and define those half relationships to tell Watto what you already know about this uh, family situation. After you've put everybody in, you'll want to enter the total amount of shared DNA for each match that you have. So you just click on the match, go down to enter match CM, and you'll put in that total amount of shared DNA. That makes the tree look like this. So you can see I've put Raymond right here in the tree. And this is kind of where Watto Plus differs from regular Watto. In regular Watto, you had to build out your own line a bunch of times and add yourself as the hypotheses. But this new, new version allows you just to click on the ancestor that you think is the person that belongs in your tree and ask Watto, what do you think? So we're going to click on Raymond. And we're going to click on use as hypothesis. And then you push the button. And it says, possible. Great, but is that good enough? So the thing about Watto, the way the math works, the way the tool works, is it's meant to have you ask multiple scenarios at one time. It it's, can say, yeah, that's fine. But there are other possible relationships also. And so even though we don't really have any other brothers that we know of, but again, we haven't done all the genealogy, so we might want to ask, well, what if there was another brother? Or what if there was a half-brother? So you want to ask Watto all the possible scenarios you can possibly think of that might explain your relationship to this family. So I might add, again, I added a half-child of John. I added this other random line down here at the bottom. And what you want to do is understand that these hypotheses are then compared against each other. So you can see the one at the bottom is a zero, red. It means not possible. So genetically, you cannot fit there, which is really helpful. Okay, but we've got two scenarios that are both green, both possible. But one is, you know, 100% possible, and the other is less than 1% possible. These are the kinds of numbers you like to see. A lot of times with this tool, you'll get percentages that are relatively similar, which means the tool's uncertain. And there are multiple explanations for how you could fit into this tree, and you're going to need more data. But in our case, this is pretty good, right? Pretty convincing. So is this our answer? And how will we know? And here's where we really hit the limit of DNA testing. Because to our knowledge, no descendants of Raymond have taken a DNA test. This is as far as DNA can take us. 
We can go to the genealogy. Again, I'd still like to find him in the right place at the right time. So I'd love a newspaper article or something to say, hey, Raymond's in town. Like, that would be really helpful. But I don't know if we're going to find that. And so this is where we're left. And it's really up to you as a researcher. And you make these decisions all the time. Is this enough for you to feel confident in putting this person in your tree? There isn't a right answer. The right answer is we would need to test a descendant of Raymond, and that would help us significantly. But do you want to do that? Do you want to track somebody down and be like, hey, I think your ancestor is like, you know, maybe you do, but maybe you don't. So there are limitations to what DNA can tell you, but man, isn't that amazing? All that we just found out in not very much time. And it really has to do with following a system and staying organized and following through with each step and not getting distracted, not chasing down a fun lead down this aisle, right? You're just staying so focused on your goal. So following a plan, being patient, being willing to build out those quick and simple trees, even though it feels a little not right, is going to get you to your answer faster and more accurately, really, uh, than, than kind of being more haphazard about it. Okay, so this is the end. Um, Ruztech is really hoping that you will fill out their feedback forms and let them know what you think of speakers and um, topics. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have a part five series that we're doing next week on March 7th. It's Thursday at 2 Eastern. So I will be talking about situations where there are multiple relationships and how to handle those, as well as some bottoms up if you don't have those best known matches. So again, I was like, I can fit everything in four lectures. Yeah, I can't. So if you'd like to come, it's free, but you do have to register so you'll get the link. This is the QR code, but you can also go to um, slash Roots Tech, and you can see it on there as well. Um, we do have some time for questions. There is a microphone here and a microphone there. They like it if you speak into those, but we can probably get around that. Good question, yes. So if you're not able to come on Thursday, we will be recording it. So if you register, I'll send you the link to watch it, and it will be available for one week. So you'll watch, be able to watch it between Thursday and the Thursday after that. Yes. Okay, so he's asking on that slide, let's go back to it. The difference is I made him a half. Yeah. You're right, though. Yeah, because Raymond's just a, a placeholder. I could put a million people there. We get 100% for all of them. Right, yes. So that's a half. That was the distinction. That's why that second hypothesis is lower, is because I made him a half. This question is to fulfill a promise to my grandson. My very young grandson tells everyone he's a quarter Mexican. He's not. This is after his mother talked him down from telling everyone he was half Mexican. After I told him about Roots Tech and DNA classes, and I've taken many of yours and they're wonderful, but after I told him about this, he made me promise to ask the experts where he can find a DNA test that would prove he was a quarter Mexican. Okay, <laughs> so he can test with any of our major DNA testing companies. Mm -hmm. I would recommend, um, so Ancestry and MyHeritage have the, the most granular ethnicity results, followed by 23andMe. And so not only could he find out maybe he was a quarter Mexican, but maybe even get a community or a group that would tell him exactly where in Mexico he's from. Um, so those would be my top two choices for him, and um, he would be thrilled. I mean, they're all on sale. Grandma, you can just bring a kit home. That's right. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. In the back.
I love this question. She's like, if you have endogamy, can you just pretend you don't? <laughs> um, will that work? Uh, it won't. I'm sorry. Just like you can't pretend you're a quarter Mexican. I'm sorry. We're not going to go there. <laughs> you, right, yes. So, no, it won't work. And the thing about the system, though, is that sometimes you don't know you have endogamy until you start down this path and then everybody matches everybody else and you're like, Diane is full of it. She has no idea what she's talking about. This does not work. Okay? If you find yourself in that situation where everybody's matching everybody else, you have endogamy. And so it just, it doesn't work. It's too messy. Everybody's too interrelated. So you just have to use different techniques to find your best matches to work with, unfortunately. Or fortunately. Could be fun. Yes. Hi. I think I know the answer to this, but I just wanted to verify. When you refer to multiple relationships, what are you referring to? Okay, so multiple relationships and endogamy are two different things, but we often conflate the two. So endogamy is like a systematic cultural or geographical issue where people are consistently after generation after generation intermarrying. Multiple relationships is more like first cousins marrying first cousins, creating these double relationships underneath them. So that's what I mean by multiple relationships, where it's more definable and it's just like a single incident in your family tree and not this kind of systematic, widespread, all over thing. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Hi. I'm gonna try to not make this confusing, but um, I, I'm trying to figure out, so I have worked on this one woman's She's my third great grandmother, and I've like really worked up her whole life. <laughs> and but I don't know her father because she was illegitimate. So I have my dad's DNA. So for her, for him, that's his second great grandmother. I also have a, another descendant of hers, um, and for him, that's his great grandmother. So, but the way they connect, she had two children that were half siblings. So they are descend from half siblings. Now, can I just go to their shared matches and skip all of that? Or should I do work up each one and figure out like what you did, your whole process for each, for my dad and for this great grandson of hers? Okay. So to figure out her father. Hopefully, you were drawing in your mind her family tree, because that's what I was doing. So if you picture it, we've got essentially half second cousins once removed. That's the relationship of your dad and this cousin, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I drew my mental tree correctly. Okay, half second cousins once removed. Their common ancestor is this one woman. Right. Right? So this is why I'm saying everybody needs half people, because... Yes, their shared matches list should only be people who are related to her. So they are going to be her other descendants, and they are going to be people who are related to her parents and grandparents and so on. So yes, you can just use that shared matches list if it's big enough to help you. Again, we're just talking two people and their shared matches, so you might need to expand that group using some of these techniques, but you can certainly begin with that group and see how far you can get. Okay, because one issue I'm having is that there are people, so they're from another country, but they have a lot of people in my heritage. Yeah. And, and then they have a sm very small set in ancestry, so I'm like trying to figure out how to... Yeah, yeah, you know. and I think what you just said is often the case for mm -hmm. international matches. There's often more at my heritage than there are at other companies. They just seem to have a more international database. So I would just focus my efforts at my heritage for now use the dots to label them, find their generation of connection, do all of those things right there at MyHeritage and see what you can learn. So, so do work up the whole process for each one? For each testing company? Or yeah. you mean? So well, for each just, person, so like my so dad and So you're clicking your dad relative. and this cousin and you're looking at their one shared matches list. Right. Just those people. Just those people. Just so I can there. skip all of that and just You can skip all them. the other things unless that, that list isn't enough. Okay. Because it will I be may... small. And there are other people who belong on that list who aren't going to share with right. both of them. Especially maybe the one where he's the great grandson. And yeah. I'm trying to figure out his great great grandson. Exactly. Right. Yes, because he has the more more. He DNA. might have more. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Yes. Hi. I found my bio family through uh, the DNA Angels. And I found that um, my grandparents, and then they had 
five boys, two girls. I eliminated three of the boys down to the two. One could be my father. Now, is this procedure you did today one that would help me with that, or do I need the bottoms up? Well, so you're at, you're at the end now. You're where we were here, where Dina can't tell you any more unless you ask either the men themselves if they're still around or their children to test. That's your only option to figure mm -hmm. out which of those two it is. You would have to approach someone and ask them to test. I asked who I thought was my half-brother, and he is doesn't want the government to have his DNA. Yeah. Um, but I found a second cousin who knew him and the other man, and she hypothesized that the one, because he was stationed in Long Beach where I was born, as in the Navy. Right, so you have all the circumstantial evidence, you have right place, right time, that's all you can do without another DNA test. Okay, that's it. thank you. Uh, my question is, once, once you have a hypothesis and you feel like you have enough proof for the hypothesis, what kind of uh, evidence do you record if you choose to put that into your private tree and especially if you choose to put it into the shared tree? Yeah, so good question. So there isn't a, a really standard way. What I think I usually do is I do cite that the research that I did just very summarizely, it's not a word, very simply you summarize it, right? And so it's, it's about looking at what we just did like that we share this amount of DNA, which equals these kinds of relationships, and then we did this, and there are five other matches, and the Watto tool says this, and you would just kind of write it up in a notes section so that anybody coming across that tree would then realize why you made that connection, especially if there is no document, which in many cases there won't be. You've just got to put your DNA evidence out there for people to see and understand. There isn't a really nice way yet I don't think, anyway, unless somebody else knows something else, but yeah. Similar to the last person's question, about four years ago I was searching for birds. I was able to find them, but it took a while, and I was building out the trees. I wish I had your information at the time. I would have made things easier. But my question is, when you're building out all of these hypothetical trees, I was getting a lot of feedback from the community about what I had done wrong you know, that I was messing up other people's research by having incorrect information. So is there a best practice in the community when you know you're just hypothesizing, if that's a word, to make your tree private versus public until you've confirmed the details? So she's asking really about if you're putting stuff in your tree that you're not substantiated and you don't know what, if any of it's right, like how do you handle that? If you're dealing with a sensitive situation like a birth family, I make the tree private. You, you don't want any of that stuff out there circulating while you're still trying to figure everything out. And even after, it, you know, obviously they're not going to show the names of living people, but still the sensitive nature of it, I just don't make those trees private. But if you're looking for your two times great grandparent, I don't think it's that big of a deal and I leave those trees public. And I usually note, um, like sometimes just like uh, putting in the suffix field of your ancestor's name, I'll put like, um, like, yeah, potential or something like that, and they're like in all caps, so that people understand that I'm just like working this out. Thank you. Okay, so first thing, plug, delete all of those dots. <laughs> Yay! You watching at home, delete the dots I did last year in your class. I've worked it this year. And sitting in class today, I found the person I'm looking for that will make it happen. Sweet! Look at that! So. Congratulations! Round of applause. That's awesome. Good for you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, one more question. Hi. Uh, yeah, my, my question is this. This is really good when you can establish an, a relationship. It tells you where you fit in. Uh, one of the problems I experience is there's not only a lack of people, but a lack of records. Somewhere you have to have a record with a name on it. Uh, what's a, what's a, a advice do you have for finding some of these records, if they exist, or even knowing if they exist? So finding a record to prove a genetic hypothesis essentially is his question. So I don't know if you were able to catch our search party um, lecture that was on Thursday at 4.30. 
but it was the one I missed. Oh, well, it's recorded. You can go back and watch it. But obviously, I'm invested in the search party method. But what I love about it most is that.